All right, so we're going to actually turn now to the passage that I want to speak about. Um, and if you could turn with me, um, I'm going to be reading in a different translation, so sorry, I know that can cause some confusion. But if you don't want to turn to me, just listen to what I'm about to say. And we're reading from James 1, 2 through 8. So read with me God's word. Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds. For you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. And let steadfastness have its full effect that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God, who gives generously to all without reproach, and it will be given him. But let him ask in faith with no doubting, for the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea that is driven and tossed by the wind. For that person must not suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. He is a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. Let's pray. Lord God, we acknowledge that our faith is tested. We go through trials and we go through hardships. And sometimes we cry out to you asking, why God, why me? What did I do to deserve this? Lord, we fail to see the bigger picture that you are our ultimate provider and protector. So, Lord, when we face those trials, let us be able to say, I can count it all as joy because we understand that you are our king. We love you and we give you all the praise and all the glory and all of the honor because you're the only one worthy of it. Amen. <clears throat> so, at first, I want to start talking about this and say that I'm not an expert in trials or hardships. I feel like I have a very blessed life. I have an amazing welcome family. I have a new wife, two weeks and one day, who's counting. Okay? But so I, I'm not, I haven't been there. You know, I haven't had, you know, a, a sickness or a disease that's uncurable. I haven't lost a family member too soon. But I know that some of you have. Some of you may have gone through sicknesses. Some of you may have may be fighting sicknesses now. Some of you may have lost loved ones that you think you lost too soon. So I want to start by saying that I am not an expert when it comes to trials, and I can't give you all, you know, the little tips and tricks to kind of conquer your fears of all these trials and hardships that you do face. But I do want to be able to point you towards Scripture so that when you do and when you are confronted with trials, you know that God still loves you, and He's still in control. So I just want to start with that. Just know that I'm not an expert. If you come to me after saying, I'm struggling with this, how do I fix it? I'm, I'm probably not going to be able to give you the answers. But I will tell you that God still loves you and God still has a plan to protect his people. But why do we have to talk about trials? I'm sure I could go on for 30 minutes saying, Jesus loves you, this I know for the Bible tells me so. Or, yay, God is so good, he created everything, he's the number one person in my life, I love Jesus, yay. I could do that, and we could all leave here all happy, jumping up on joy, for, yay, Jesus is great. But it doesn't change one fact, and it's life is hard. We all go through trials, we all go through hardships. No matter who you are, no matter what walk of life you're in, you will go through tough, tough times. Life is hard. And no matter who you are, you will face many, many challenges in your life. There's a lot of times in our lives where we're going to go and just cry out, Why God? Why? Why me? Why did my son or daughter die? Why did I lose my job? Why am I on the verge of bankruptcy? Why God? We're all going to be faced with these things sometime or another in our lives. <laughs> so this passage is crazy because the passage starts out saying, count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds. James is speaking specifically towards a crazy time when, when basically God's people are just spread out and they don't know where they're going. They're being chased. They're being persecuted. We're not doing that here in America. We're not being persecuted. But James is writing to a group of people that's having a rough, rough time. But we still can count joy when we face trials and hardships. And it might be confusing to you. It might be scratching your head like, why would I be happy? Why would I count it as joy if I'm suffering? And that's perfectly okay because it doesn't really make sense. Okay, so for the next couple minutes, I'm going to kind of talk to you why I think this passage is claiming that you can count it all as joy. And I have three specific reasons. 
the first point that I want to make is that God has a purpose in life's inevitable trials. We must look joyfully for God's purpose when we encounter them. Okay? The first thing I want to talk to you about is it comes in verse 2 of our passage. It says, when you meet trials of various kinds. That word when is a definite. Okay? We are going to meet those trials. Okay? It's not a maybe, or it could happen, or it, it may, I mean, I guess my life could be bad. It's a when you meet trials of various kinds. Definite, definite are going to happen. You will face trials of various kinds. So what is our response to that? And our passage tells us exactly what that is. But first I want to talk to you about um, a couple of reasons for trials. There's, maybe God is trying to teach us something. Maybe he's trying to teach us a lesson in patience. Maybe he's trying to teach us to grow closer to him rather than closer to what we personally want in our selfish desires. Sometimes trials are just, you know, random coincidence. You get in a car wreck and maybe that's not really, you know... 100% going to teach you something, but you still are going through tough times. And then at the same time, if you believe God is a loving, beautiful, beautiful creator, you have to believe that there's a man, Satan, out there who wants to tear you apart from God. So Satan is just as likely to throw a trial your way and rip you apart from your relationship with God. So there's, <coughs> excuse me, there's multiple, multiple reasons why we'll be facing those trials. And we're going to be facing these trials. So, I'm in my first, or I finished my first year of seminary. So, yay. What the hell? All right. Um, so, the, the one thing that stood out to me the most so far was a simple picture. Out of all the books I read, out of all the papers I wrote, it was a simple picture that really has stuck with me the most. And my professor, I'm not going to put it up there because it's a little graphic, but my professor put it up. And it was of a mother holding a dead child. And it was the result of a suicide bombing somewhere in the Middle East. And we just sat there and we looked at the picture for at least 15 to 20 seconds, but it felt like three hours because it was just a hard, hard hitting picture. And my professor said one thing. He said, the world is not supposed to be like this. Women, mothers like that are not supposed to hold dead children. We are not supposed to be faced with these trials and hardships, but we do, and that's a result of sin. If you go back to Genesis, God created everything, and it was good. God created the earth. God created the fish. God created the beasts of the earth. God created everything, and it was all good and pleasing to Him. We didn't get a single whiff of a trial or a hardship until sin entered the picture. And then after sin into the picture, you get things like the pain in childbearing will be more. Or you will work by the sweat of your brow. Life is hard now. Life is not what it was originally created to be. So remember that when we face these trials and hardships, the world is not supposed to be like that. When you turn on the news and, and the U.S. is talking about going back to Iraq, the world is not supposed to be like that. God did not originally create it to be filled with war, disease, and destruction. But it is. And we do face trials. We do face hardships. Our faith is tested. So make sure you know that. Don't be naive to the fact that the world is broken, that bad things happen. Okay? And I also want you to know that trials are inevitable. No matter how hard you fight it, sometimes life is going to just sucker punch you in the face. And it's going to get hard. But that's okay. Because we're going to see very soon that we can count it all as joy. Because we have a beautiful and caring creator that wants the best for his people. So that's my first point. Trials are inevitable. No matter who you are or where you're from. And the world is not supposed to be like that. But it is. Remember, we still have God. So moving on to, I think, the most important point, And it's, it's probably the most practical point for you guys and for me as well. And that is simply that when we are faced with the inevitable trials in our lives, we are to approach them, approach them with a strong sense of faith in God and not in man. Not in ourselves. So basically, you can think of this as basically what we typically do and what God calls us to do. What we typically do is basically try to conquer these trials on our own. Oh, I'll power through it. I'll figure it out myself. 
But what God calls us to do is just run to Him, pray, submit, and run to Him, and realize even though things may not go our way, God is still in control. We should always run and trust in God. So let's go back to our text, because I'm pretty sure this is what the text is trying to get us to understand. In verse 6, it says, For the man who doubts is like a wave of the sea that is driven and tossed by the wind. And then later in verse 8, it says, He is a double-minded man, unstable in all of his ways. So this is kind of describing the person that basically is putting all their faith in themselves. Okay, They're not putting their faith in God. They're doubting in God, and they're trying to fight through these trials on their own. I kind of like to think of this person as, as trying to walk on a waterbed. You guys know what a waterbed is? Yeah. Okay, maybe the 70s, 80s kind of thing, maybe the 60s. I don't know what it was created. I wasn't a lot. But my parents used to have one. Have you ever tried to walk on a waterbed? Anybody? Anybody? Okay, so thank you for being honest. All right, so when you walk on a waterbed, it's not the easiest thing, right? You kind of like, uh, like, you don't know. Like, okay, so basically, I would always try to do that, and I would try to see how long it lasts. But eventually, no matter what, I would crash and burn, not burn, but I would just fall because water bed wouldn't really burn, and water doesn't make sense. So basically, it's the idea that when you don't place your faith in God, you're kind of walking on a water bed, okay? You might be able to go along for a little bit, but eventually, you're going to fall. Bad things are going to knock you off your feet. Okay, this is, the, this is the kind of, I kind of call this person basically the, the self-made man. The, the person that's like, you know what, I grew up in a hard neighborhood, but I got out of it. I got good grades. I got into a good school. I got great scholarships. When I was done, I got into a great graduate program. When I was done with that, I got a great job, great, great salary. I have a, found a great family. I did this, I did this, I did this. I did all of it on my own. That's basically somebody who's not putting any faith and trusting God, and he's putting all of it on his own shoulders, and he's saying, I did all of this for me. It's the self-made man. And on the surface, he may look strong, he may look tough, and he may look like he's got everything together, but inside there's a battle that is raging. Because, like we talked about earlier, he is faced with trials and hardships. And, and there's a couple of things that happen when this guy faces those trials and hardships and try to power through it on his own strength. One is basically kind of this, this guy usually is always about control and wants to control everything and things don't go his way when he's confronted with a trial or a hardship. Basically, he can shut down and just crash and burn and just fall to the floor because he can't fix it. I know, and you can talk to my now wife, I was driving along one time and something happened in my car and I was doing perfectly fine. I was perfectly happy. We were having a great conversation. Something happened in my car and immediately I just like shut down. I was like, this is out of my control. I hate this. This is not fun. Okay, so I basically just shut down because I was no longer in control. Life was giving me a curveball and I couldn't hit it. Okay, so that's one response that this man could have. He basically just shuts down. He, when he loses control, he just doesn't play anymore. He's just done. Another thing which I think is even worse is that when trials come his way, he triumphs over them. He actually, when something happens, he climbs over that mountain on his own strength and he comes to completion, and he faces that trial head on, and he completes it. Now, why is that a bad thing? That's a bad thing, because when he does it on his, on his strength entirely, he completely misses God. He completely misses our beautiful, beautiful creator God, who says, run to me, and you will be safe. He misses out on that joy. When he's doing things all for himself, he misses out on the beauties of God. And you do not want to miss out on that because God is good, God is great, and He is a loving and grateful and ultimate provider for us. So do not be quick to run away from God. Do not put all your try and all your power into trying to conquer these hurdles on your own. Instead, run to God. And that's the other side, and that's what God calls us to do. And in verse 3 and 4 of our passage, it tells you exactly what to do. It says, For you know that testing of your faith produces steadfastness, and let steadfastness have its full effect, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. Lacking in nothing. The man that does everything on his own power is not given that blessing. But the people who place their faith in God 
and their trust in God can get to a point where they can grow in God and they can say that I'm lacking in nothing because God is sufficient for me. No matter what life throws at me, I'm still on God's side and God has my back. So while the man that doubts God is like standing on a waterbed, remember I didn't say that, okay, the man that has places his faith in God is standing on a solid foundation, firm foundation. He's no longer wobbling, trying to walk on water, okay? Sometimes he might get pushed back over, but it's so much easier to get back up on solid foundation. So those of you that walked on a waterbed, if you, if you have fallen off of that waterbed or fallen down on the waterbed, it's still a little hard to even get up. But when you fall down on a solid floor, it's a lot easier to pick yourself up. God provides you with that. So what God calls us to do in this passage when we're faced with the testing of our faith and faced with trials and hardships is we're called to go to Him, pray, submit to Him, and ask in faith, God, give me wisdom so I can become steadfast and that have your steadfastness have its full effect on me, that I, can, that, that I can become perfect and lacking in nothing. That's amazing, an amazing truth. And if you're able to say that in the midst of trials, you're able to say that basically in the hardest parts of life. And you can say, God is bigger than this world. God is bigger than the trials that I face. That brings me joy because God is our ultimate protector, ultimate provider. And his protection is far greater than the protection I can offer myself. So don't be like, like the self-made man, the man that puts all his, that, that just does everything by his own strength. Be like the people of God and be the ones who ask for faith in God and put their trust in God. Because those are the people that when you're faced with trials, when you lose a child, you can say, you know what, this is horrible. This is the worst thing that could possibly happen in my life. But God's plan is perfect. And these are the kind of people that when they lose their job and maybe they're on the verge of being homeless, they can say, life is hard, but God is our protector and he is perfect. When you're able to place your faith in God, you can live a life where, where you can just pick yourself back up after being sucker punched by life and you continue to stand tall for your beliefs. And you continue to stand tall because of the faith you have in God. Because, again, He is bigger than this world. When you place your faith in God, you're placing your faith in something that is stronger than whatever evil can be thrown your way. Now, I kind of want to try to clear this point up uh, by telling you uh, a story that I heard one time. And I think it was, it was probably one of the most powerful stories that I have ever heard. And I don't want to kind of rouse you a, a wave of patriotism because it probably will do that and it's perfectly okay. But that's not really what I'm, what I'm about to say. Um, so everybody here knows the, the events of September 11, 2001, correct? Okay, it's the, the attack of the Twin Towers. It's one of the worst terrorist attacks in the modern era, especially on American soil. Maybe not, if not in the modern era, maybe even the entire existence of America, the worst terrorist attack. Terror, destruction, death, hatred, anger were all captured in four airplanes used as missiles. They were captured by all this anger by this group of people that held human life to no regard. They just wanted to inflict as much pain as possible. They wanted to strike terror into our nation. And I'll admit, they did it to me. I was scared. I remember sitting in my class and with all my friends just watching the towers fall one by one. And I was scared. I was hurt. I didn't know what was going on. I actually had trouble sleeping for months after because I didn't even know if I was safe. We witnessed a horrible, horrible terrorist attack. And our nation was basically being tested by this terror. We were facing pure evil. But what did we do? Did we run away? Did we give in to terror? Did we shut down? No. We stood tall, we rallied, and we took a hard approach, and we actually waged war on terror. We actually called the war the war on terror because of the events of 9-11. But I don't really want to talk about military strategies. I don't want to get too political or anything, because I'm sure we have people on both sides, and that's not what I want to try to do. Um, but I do want to talk about one way that our nation responded, and I think is an amazing, amazing story. So can you put up the, the first picture of the ship? So have you guys heard of the USS New York? Anybody? Anybody? A couple people. Thanks, And so 
basically this ship, there's actually been a handful of ships that have borne that title this as New York, but this is the one that currently has the name. And it actually finished construction after 9-11 attacks. And you guys know the front of the ship, the bow of the ship, okay, the front of the ship. The amazing thing about this ship is that that is made of 20 tons of steel that is actually salvaged wreckage from the Twin Towers attacks. So we went to the worst terrorist attack on American soil, and we took 20 tons of that steel, basically 20 tons of the damage that was done by those, those people, those, those, the people just that held no human life um, to any regard. And we smelted it down, and we made it the front of a battleship. We basically stood tall, and we made a claim saying, your terror does not affect us. We are stronger as a nation now than ever before. And we are going to wage war on those forces that have brought evil onto us. So that's an amazing story. That's powerful. When I first heard that, I was like on the floor. I was like, that's awesome. That is great. That's like our perfect, perfect reaction. But it's important to know that our nation is still run by sinners. I'm a sinner. You're a sinner. Our Congress, our Senate, our President, we're all sinners. We're all bad people in a way. Okay? So if you think this is power, if you think this is powerful, if you think that this story is great and it shows strength and it was made by a nation of sinners, what do you guys think about the powerful message of God that He is going to protect us no matter what? When these things are happening to us, God still will protect His people. If you look all throughout the Bible, even though God's people are faced with hardships and trials and hardships and trials, no matter what, God still protects His people and He still sustains His people because He's promised to do that forever. So I look at this picture and I see power, but then I look at the Bible and I see even more power. I see a God that loves us enough that no matter what evil can be thrown at us, He still says, run to me, all you are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. I will give you peace. Just come to me and it's okay. Everything will be okay. When you're faced with trials and hardships and your faith is tested. I can find joy in the fact that my God is bigger than the world. I can find joy in the fact that my God is bigger than whatever evil is thrown my way. And hopefully, if you're able to place your faith in God, you can too. You can look and go on the news and see all these horrible things that are happening. So the world's not supposed to be like this, but I place my faith in something far stronger. I place my faith in God, the wonderful, perfect creator who has promised to give me eternal life through his son, Jesus Christ. So we know that trials are inevitable. We're all going to face them. We know that there's two ways to approach our trials. We can try to do it on our own strength, or we can try to do it with God. But what if, what if we can't? What if we're confused? What if we have a little bit of doubt? What do we do then? And I think our passage here today helps us get to a point of coming to a fuller understanding of what we need to do. So that's, this is my third point. My third and last point is when we doubt to fail, or, sorry, when we doubt or fail to have faith in God's plan, we can ask God for wisdom and He will provide it for us. So when we're saying, you know what, I get it, Tyler. You're saying, have faith in God. Everything's going to be okay. But how do I do that? How do I do that? How do I have the wisdom to do that? Our passage simply says, ask God in faith and He will give it to you. In verse 5, right here. If anyone lacks wisdom, let him ask God who gives generously to all without reproach. And it will be given him. Let him ask in faith. That's all God's asking us to do. Turn towards him. Turn towards the scriptures. Understand what he's trying to say in the Bible. And that is simply, I love you. Just run to me. Ask me for wisdom and I will give it to you without reproach. I will make you perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. But it is hard, and there's no one Christian that can say that, oh, I do this all the time, and I have no problem with trials, because we are going to get knocked down from time to time. But again, when we're on that solid foundation, God, it's so much easier to get back up. 
when we place our faith in God and when we ask God for more wisdom, we'll be able to stand tall and look up towards God and explain that He is where my help comes from. He is my protection. He is the one that grants me a steadfast heart. In Psalms 121, my favorite psalm, it says, I lift my eyes up to the hills from where does my help come? My help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. No matter what I'm going through, I don't have to worry about conquering these hurdles on my own because my help comes from the Lord, our God. So ask God for wisdom. Ask Him so that you can trust Him more and that you can have a stronger faith so you can say, my God is stronger than this world and all the trials that can come with it. So I saw this cartoon recently and there's a giant debate in it. I don't think it's 100% theologically correct in it, so don't like hold me against that. Um, but I think it does a great job at basically showing you a person who doesn't quite get it. He's looking at the small picture, doesn't quite put their, their faith in God fully. And at the end of it, that person's mindset will change and he will see exactly what God's doing. So if you can't see it, I'll kind of explain it. The very beginning, it's a little, this little guy basically saying, God, please protect me, starts walking away and he gets hit in the head with a rock. And then he starts crying, why God, why? I just pray to you. He just asks you for protection. And then he looks up and he sees a guy who's picking as Jesus, and it says, I'm sorry, did I miss one? Are you all right? And so I, I kind of, I just look at this and I laugh it off, and I, just, I think it's kind of funny, kind of like to think of Jesus being like sarcastic, be like, oh, sorry about that. Um, but again, that's um, another theological debate for another time, we don't have to worry about that. So you can take it off before I get thrown off the stage. Um, but basically, it captures two people. It captures somebody that doesn't quite understand just what God has done. Somebody that doesn't quite have the wisdom that you would need to be able to say that my God is strong and my God is perfect. But then at the end of it, that person just changed because that person visibly sees God at work doing so much for him. So that's the difference. That's, that's one person who, who doesn't have the faith and basically it's going through that process and he gets to a point where he then has that faith. So that's what happens when we, when we turn to God and ask him for wisdom. We basically are at a place of saying, I don't get it all, God. Please help me. Grant me wisdom so that I can understand you and I can understand why I'm facing these trials. And then instead of saying, why God, why? We can look at him and say, it's okay, because I count all joy, because I know what you have done for me, I know what you are doing for me, and I know what the future holds. And that's what I want to conclude with. I want to conclude with what the future holds. So before I get to the conclusion, I just want you to understand, and I want you to hopefully you can take away this. When you're faced with trials, don't look at the small picture all the time. Don't look at just that trial that is at hand. You might have to, to, to get over it to, to basically work through it. That's fine. But keep in mind always the big picture that God is still more powerful. Okay, so I want to I conclude with this. Okay, remember when I said that life is hard? I, I said that. Um, and re remember when I said that the world is not supposed to be like this? Talking about the picture of that woman holding a dead child. Well, again, it is so true. The world is not supposed to be like this. We're not supposed to live in a life and a world full of hardships and trials. But we do. But we have a great Heavenly Father who has provided a way for us to conquer that, to conquer this world. Jesus Christ came and He lived a perfect life. And He died a death we all deserve. And on three days later, He rose again, conquering death, saying, I beat the world. I have defeated the powers of Satan. I have defeated hell. Now, if anybody believes in me, you too can defeat this world. So remember, the world is not supposed to be like that. But when we are believers in Jesus Christ, when we run to Him... We can say, too, that we have defeated the world, this world full of hurt, pain, death, war, disease, destruction. When we have Jesus, when we are on Jesus' side, when we are on God's side, our ultimate perfect creator, we have defeated this world that has been corrupted by sin. So when we're faced with trials, when bad things happen to us, fix your eyes on God. 
Fix your eyes on Jesus and what he has done. Fix your eyes on his promises and that he promises to one day come back and make all things new. So that the struggles we have and the trials and the testing of our faith that we have in this life will one day be gone. And God will make everything back to where it was originally created. And he will turn it back into a perfect and good creation where we all can live and praise his glorious, glorious name. So count it all joy when we face suffering because we see the bigger picture as Christians. Because we see that God is still in control of everything. So run towards Him. Amen. Let's pray. Lord God, we just thank You so much for, for being the Creator, being the loving, sustaining God. We thank You so much for that truth. We thank You for everything you do in our lives. And we acknowledge that sometimes we cry out saying, why God, why? And we don't quite understand what's going on. But thank you to giving us the gift of simple prayer where we can ask you for wisdom and you will grant it to us. Let us better understand you, God. And thank you for making it so easy and so attainable where all we have to do is pray to you, Father. We want to give you all the praise and all the glory and all the honor because you're the only one worthy of it, our perfect, ultimate creator and loving God. Amen.